This is Adam Paltrus of Coral Clarity, and I'm introducing Ryan Main here. Now, this is actually the first time Ryan and I have ever spoken. We've been on for about 60 seconds before we put this through, and um, I'm very, very excited about this. Um, so, Ryan, first of all, welcome. Thanks for Thank doing this. Thank you so this. much. I'm glad to be here. So, um, the way I became familiar with you, Ryan, was uh, I was listening to Chris Muntz's uh, Coralosophy podcast, sure. and he had been talking about you, and you've been advertising with him. And so I came uh, across your website, listened to your music, ordered a few pieces, and um, so I've been sort of following you for the last few years, but we, we really never touched base until recently when you uh started your own online publishing company so yeah. i'm going to be asking you questions just right off the bat and you know this could be a full you know just a conversation but i'm, I'm asking you because i really know absolutely nothing about where you came from and and what you do so can you uh, share a little bit about your uh composing journey absolutely yeah i i, I think i've got kind of a interesting winding story so uh I, i'll i'll start uh from high school uh basically i was in wind ensemble i was a trumpet player and i music uh, never quite fully made sense to me until i took this music theory class my senior year of high school i had a really wonderful uh theory teacher who had also been my band director before that and uh, I, I was uh, sitting at the piano and trying to figure out, you know, first off, where's metal C? Uh, and then uh, how, do I, how do I check my part writing to hopefully make this theory thing make more sense? Uh, <clears throat> because I kept having parallel fifths in my yeah. writing. And I, I couldn't see it. And then when I sat down at the piano, suddenly I started to be able to see it. And the next thing I knew it, it everything just started to kind of make sense. It was almost like the the uh, keys on the piano were lighting up mm. uh, before I could even play them. Like I knew where to go next, and and so the next thing I knew, I was just sitting at the piano for hours and hours every day, uh, kind of bear clawing my way through chord progressions and melodies. And my my teacher saw that I you know the light bulb was starting to come on over my head as he described it. And he started to give me these extra assignments. You know, here's a melody, write a chord progression. Here's a chord progression, write a melody. And uh, soon, yeah, you know, within about uh, two years, I was uh, studying music composition at the University of Missouri, Kansas City. And I got my undergraduate degree there. Uh, again, mostly writing for wind ensemble for instrumental groups. Uh, but it was there that I had my first choral experience. Uh, I joined choir for the first time my my junior year of college, and it was just this really wonderful kind of life changing experience for me. Uh, and and truly, the first time that I'd been part of a, an ensemble that was I, I would describe as truly great, truly exceptional. Um, and and th that was also something that was really formative for me. And uh, I went on to. Uh, study music composition and music education uh, at the Peabody uh, Conservatory. And uh, when I got out, I was a teacher, I was a composer, I was doing a little bit of everything. And uh, I, I started writing choral music for my students uh, as a, a teacher who was teaching band, choir, orchestra, all of the above. Yeah. Uh, but I kept connecting more and more with choir. I just found that that's where uh, my strength was as a teacher and where my strength was as a composer, I think, and uh, where, to be frank, where the most interest was in the market as well from people interested in, in uh, programming my music. And so it's just been kind of this uh, slow growing love affair with uh, choral music and, and uh, on every front for me. And now it's, it's everything that I do. And you still live in Kansas City? I do, yeah. I, I moved away for uh, grad school. I, I, that was in Baltimore, uh, where I lived for three right. years, and I, I really, I, I liked it there a lot. I, I really thought about staying, but uh, you know, my whole family's here in Kansas City, and um, I like, I like a lot of uh, things about this city. It's, it's really 
uh, revitalized quite a bit over the last few years. So yeah, I'm I'm here, and I think I'm I'm here to for for good. That's awesome. It's a great yeah. city. I've, I've been there once, long, long time ago. Yeah, um, come on back. Well, yeah, I'd love we'll take to. you to some good restaurants. All right. Well, that's <laughs> now you're talking my language. Restaurants. <laughs> you'll see the passion. My eyes light up when we start talking about restaurants. Yeah. Um, so so in terms of composing, you is everything up until this point that you've done uh, self-published or have you published with other companies? So I, I had experience early on in my career when I was still writing primarily for instrumental groups. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I uh, had a piece published my, uh, my senior year of undergrad as I was getting ready to go into graduate school. I had my first piece published for Wind Ensemble and that was through a traditional publishing route. Uh, and while that was really exciting, and I, I liked so much of of uh, what came with that, what I, I noticed is that you know the the sales reports were really cool. This music's getting programmed, it's getting <laughs> performed in all these different places, and then yep. the uh, to be frank, the the uh, royalties that came with that just did not feel at all commensurate with. Uh, the amount of work that had gone into to writing the piece. And, and for those who don't know, uh, in a traditional publishing model, composers make 10% of the selling price of the music. And so, you know, e even though I had this one piece that was doing really well, and then I'd started to publish more pieces at this point, I was, I just felt somewhat discouraged. I, I you know, to be frank, I was getting really busy as a teacher I, I felt like I was being pulled in a lot of directions and it was hard to find the time to keep writing when there just wasn't this incentive in place uh, to keep doing it from, from that perspective. And so when I started writing choir music, that, that for me seemed like this opportunity to maybe explore a, a different path. And I'd, I'd heard at that point that there were people who were self-publishing. The only ones who I knew at that time were doing it on the instrumental side. Uh, John right. Mackey uh, come, comes to mind. And uh, so, so I knew that that existed. And I, I basically just created a, a website on Weebly. I uh, put the PDF up there and said it's you know 50 bucks to download this, as, as many copies as you uh, need for your ensemble, and and that's what I did. And, and the next thing I knew, uh, that that incentive was there again because people were were downloading that music and programming it. And I I uh, just wanted to kind of keep exploring that path. So when did you start uh, self publishing? What year was it? That would have been about twenty. Uh, I want to say twenty sixteen. I believe it was. Uh, uh, end of 2015 or, or early 2016. That's, that's when I started too. I started the was same, really? same time, 2015, I started it. Um, and for the same reasons that you discussed, you know, and the other, the, the, the other factor that people need to understand is that not only do you only get 10%, but it takes somewhere between six months and a year for them to approve your music. Mm. And then it gets published. And then it's the following year after that, that you get your 10% royalty. So mm -hmm. all in all, if you composed a piece t today, it's not going to be for two and a half years from now at the minimum that you get any money. Whereas right now you can write a piece when we get off this call, put it up tonight <laughs> and start selling. Which yeah. is a, it's the t it's not just the money. It's the time too. Yeah. And I, I, I think these conversations are, sometimes I, I think difficult for for composers to have and, and sometimes even difficult for directors as well because I, I think all of us have a sense that we are in the field of music because we love it. Right. And I compose because I love it. It's, it is without a doubt true that I would still be writing in some form even if it were only as a hobby. You know, right. that that was a big part of my, my formative experience. But I, I think we all also need to be realistic that um, the people who are creating the content do deserve to be able to uh, make a, a reasonable 
portion of of the sale of that music and you know that there should be a pathway for young composers to imagine a a, a world in which they could make a living that this could be their full-time profession right. as a composer and i think truly that is better for everyone if we if we are rewarding the people who are creating the kind of the the thing that our our field centers around you know we're bringing this music to life and it's like i said i i think sometimes these conversations feel difficult at first um but i've i've gotten more comfortable with it myself uh right. that this isn't this isn't my why but it is very important it, it matters uh how how we uh how we are compensated it, it's something that we need to be able to discuss in in all fields we we yeah. need to feel like we're valued and compensated because if we are we could come from a place of um desire um and from a good a positive spot as opposed to um feeling the need to make money the need, the need because a lot of co composers let's face it are desperate to make money and mm. if we could be in this positive spot where where we feel good about what we're doing or we're being compensated for what we do, then we're going to compose better and enjoy our lives more. And we should all be doing what we love in life. I mean, that's our ultimate goal, right? Is to be yeah. doing what we love. We shouldn't feel like, oh, well, um, I shouldn't be making money doing what I love. No, that's the goal in life, to follow your passion and be successful in whatever it is that you want to do. So yeah. I think it's so important. And I think that the industry is just antiquated. Um, and you know some people have changed with the times and others have you know others have not and so i think uh, along those lines what made you go from being a self uh published composer to starting a company and what's your mission as a composer and then with your company absolutely yeah um and and just to echo what you said too i i think it is it is so true that when we are when we are coming from a place of uh, want rather than a place of need, um, I, I think uh, the the work that we produce is going to be so much more uh, so much more valuable, so much more yeah. joyful. Uh, it's I, I just I just had to say yes, <laughs> uh, jazz hands to what you said. Um, but but yeah, so your question about uh, you know why why have I taken this next step? Uh, it is a good one. And to be honest with you, it's something I went back and forth uh, on quite a bit myself. I wanted to make sure that it was going to be something that I could do well, that it would be something that uh, would be a, a value add to the choral community, uh, to the composers that I was working with, that um, essentially they'd be a force for good and not mm -hmm. um, something not not there's not some other motive there um right. uh, that that i could keep kind of on this authentic path that i've been able to to enjoy um and and so basically uh, i there there've been these kind of signposts on the way um that have helped point me in this direction and I, um one of those is that i i just keep getting uh emails from young composers and sometimes it's actually uh uh, directors who are early in their composing career, but maybe they they've been directing choir for a year or two, and then they they said, "I think there's an opportunity for something else," or maybe you know, I think, and I I thought that many of us have had, which is, I think I could do that better, mm -hmm. you know, which is yep. the impetus for a lot of uh, a lot of great innovation and. Um, so in any case, I, I get these emails uh, from people who say, would you be willing to take a look at my work? And I found myself just loving that. I, I loved giving them detailed, you know, two page bullet point notes of this is awesome. I love what you're doing here. You started to lose my attention at measure 22. And here's what I think is going on there. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you've, you've worked really hard on this transition and you need to delete it altogether. It uh -huh. just... Yeah. Yeah, transitions are completely overrated um and on and on and i i i just love this kind of back and forth i love um uh, you know i i had such a, a valuable experience with my 
composition professors in undergrad and, and grad school. And I, I also knew coming out that academia was just not going to be the route that I wanted to go. Mm -hmm. um, but I love that, that uh, mentor relationship. And so it, it, it's going to be one of my, one of my focuses, one of my, um, the things that I really want to be able to do with Endeavor is to uh, the the folks whose music I'm going to publish. I, I want to give them really good feedback. I really want to take an active role in being an editor for them uh, to help them find the the areas where their music can be better, and to also just be in conversation with them about it. Not that there's this one note of this one piece that, that needs to be fixed. But rather, here's kind of a principle to think about. Here's what's going to make your music more accessible and more programmable sure. uh, for a, a wider range of people. And and then also to be open to the idea that, you know, artistically, that's just not what I want to do. And that's okay. And it's, it's the great thing about having a company with a low overhead is I can also afford to publish music that is not necessarily mass market and right. you know that's that's something else if there's a piece i really believe in then i want to have a place to to support that and to really champion that and uh i, I just kept seeing i or i guess in a, a better way to say it is i kept feeling kind of pushed in this direction um and and that's you know uh, basically how the first line of pieces has turned out that I'm, I, I feel like I'm helping people who are just kind of taking that first step, either in publishing or even just in composing. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's exciting. So let's talk about with that, the idea of accessible music, what mm -hmm. does accessible music mean to you? Sure. I, I think as an overarching principle, it means it's never more difficult than it needs to be. I love that. Uh, Love that line. <laughs> it, it's it's just kind of a simple reminder that you can use to check any of your music at at, at any point. Can I can I restate this without losing the quality in any way, and still and and have more choirs be able to sing this? Because I, I do think that has to be our goal as a, a composer. I'm I I would I, I truly would challenge any composer who would say I. I'm writing for advanced collegiate choir. And I'd say, does that make you a better composer? It makes you a worse composer. <laughs> and we both know that because, because what they're really doing is they're saying, I'm not really thinking about my singers. I'm <laughs> just thinking about what's the easiest way to get my thoughts on the page and sound good when there's a craft mm. to, to, replicating things over and over again in simple in simple ways knowing when the leaps make the most sense knowing when you could eliminate a part because it's going to have the same effect whether that extra note is in there or not yes right all yes. those little things and there are very few composers that i speak with who are in this in this world of thinking about the accessibility yeah and and i think that you can you can have ideas as a composer that are incredibly advanced and incredibly innovative, um, incredibly e even challenging. But again, if you check that against the principle of it's never more difficult than it needs to be, mm -hmm. you can still have something that's pretty challenging, pretty tough. It's right. not saying we are, we're absolutely not dumbing down. That is, that right. thought never goes through my mind at all. And I, you know, I think I actively uh, make sure it's something I'm never doing. Mm -hmm. um, but, but the, uh, it, the, the things that you were, you were talking about, you know, I, if I add just this one extra note, as the idea repeats the second time, how much harder is it going to be for the choir to remember that? How much extra rehearsal time is going to have to be dedicated to that repetition and oh yeah remember oh you did it again okay we're gonna go back and here's what it sounds like the first time okay now here's the second time and i think being a director being a, a choir director myself is helpful with that I'm, I'm sure it is for you as well uh, yeah. 
And then, you know, for composers who maybe don't have that, that, uh, 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 foot in the the water of um, direct and choir. A simple thing that you can do for yourself is to simply sing every part of your song that you've written, beginning to end. Yep. And if you can't, or if you find something obscenely challenging as you do that, then just know your choir, your singers are also going to have that same issue, and they're not going to have the benefit of having written it. <laughs> so, you know, uh, and. Are you writing that for uh, high school choir? Then that's that's going to really limit the number of choirs that can perform it. Right, and you're thinking the end game. What's the end game? I want choirs to perform my music. So what Absolutely. choirs do you want to perform your music? I mean, if you want St. Olaf Choir to be the only choir to perform your music, go for it. Write whatever you want on paper, and if it's beautiful, maybe they'll perform it. But if you want high school choirs to perform it, um, in terms of the amount of time, rehearsal time they have, and you want to write something that is artistic, but also thinking about the human beings that are going to be in the room, the age of the students, and the you know all different levels of experience and and talent and skill at that age level, you know. So uh, relating that to sort of where I am and what I like to write about, I have a self-selected choir. So that means anybody that wants to be there is in that group. And so that has helped me so much in my in my own crafting of music because I'm thinking about everybody. I'm not just thinking about a select group of 16. I'm thinking about 70 students, some who might have may have struggled to match pitch, but have overcome they've overcome that skill, but they're still they can't sing all of it. They could sing some of it. And mm -hmm. I'm really thinking about the leaps and thinking about those um potential challenges and you learn a lot by giving music to your groups to try you really do learn a lot but i will say and i'm sure you will agree with this that the more you're in front of a choir the more you learn how to write and you don't need to test it as much um as you perhaps you may have a few years back before you had the choir it's absolutely true i i it i think that what used to take me a while in terms of after the ideas are down on paper and turning it into the kind of that finished product of a of a piece that that just does not take me nearly as much time now i i used to take probably a month to to finish any given piece at a minimum and now oftentimes i can finish a piece in a week if uh if i have enough time to work on it and it's because yeah you, you anticipate those challenges and this would be, I think, again, advice for any young composers out there who are really interested in how to have a sustainable career as a composer would be get yourself either singing in an ensemble or directing an ensemble and, and really uh, looking at the music that you're programming through that lens of I'm, I'm here to learn. I, I, I'm not, I'm here to direct, I'm here to lead, but I'm also here to learn what makes this Eschenwald's piece work for my ensemble. Why does it sound so cool, but it's also something that they love to sing that feels good for them to sing. That's great advice, great advice. So I wrote a blog post, which is when I contacted you um, on seven ways to find choral repertoire and you know, at the time I had just seen that you came out with your, with Endeavor. And so I was interested in looking into it and, and listening to the music and seeing what you're doing. I love entrepreneurs and colleagues who are really looking to build, build a business essentially in our choral world to make the world a better place. So my question for you is I'm a choral director and I'm looking for new music. So I tell somebody you should go to Endeavor, check it out what is the user experience how do you want somebody to navigate your website to find music oh that's a great question um and and i do think that that answer does depend a little bit on the person you know what what their uh style of browsing is but i i think first off having quality recordings of pieces is just essential uh from the from the publishing point of view. And that's something that 
you know, I, I am able to do uh, and I'm able to offer for uh, composers who are coming up. And uh, that is to create a, a really great demo recording where you truly get a, a sense of how this piece is going to sound. And in how addition do you do that, that, by the way, sorry to interrupt, how do you, how no. do, you do that? Sure. So uh, my wife actually is a uh, very uh, gifted singer. And so she and I will create the parts one track at a time. And I've just picked up a lot of recording and post-production skills uh, to be able to piece those recordings together. Um, and I, I should say, I, I feel like the weak link in that that quartet. But, uh -huh. uh, <laughs> uh, but I, even that I, I consider to be kind of a, a first step as a business. I, sure. I really want to get us to the place where we are doing full choir demo recordings and putting those again with scores where people are able to see directors are able to see um, the full score with uh, the absolute absolute minimum um, visual interruptions so they're able to see exactly how this piece goes exactly how it's going to work for their singers and uh, something that the composers are also going to be able to take and say I, you know, this was ink and paper yesterday, right. and now I have an awesome recording that I can I can use to to demonstrate. I I, I have this this art, and now hear it. You know, right. yeah. So with that, you know, the the biggest issue that I'm finding with the online publishing companies, and I write about it too, is you know, what's I forgot the name. The name escapes me. What's the the big prominent? Um, company uh with where they have so many um self-published pieces um is it uh, uh graphite not graphite 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 is great um yeah it's uh oh i just forgot it it's it's they charge two dollars a copy and they've got like 50 or 60 different com um composers on there um is it music spoke yes music spoke that's ah, exactly okay right. so sure. here so here's my issue so I go on Music Spoke. I think that they're great. I, I think it's a clean website. They got obviously have really talented composers. But how on earth do I search for something? I don't know what I'm searching for. You know, it's not like I'm I when I'm picking music for my choir, I'm not thinking, well, my theme is going to be a tree. Let me find tree music. I'm really just kind of looking for cool pieces mm. by great composers. But there's no easy way to find what I'm looking for there, which is why I talk about when you go to, let's say, YouTube and you follow the links and go, okay, I like, you know, Chris Manu or I like Chris Muntz or whoever, another Chris, any Chris out there. And I love their work. So I like that piece. So let me see where that leads me through YouTube, right? Mm -hmm. um, or I go to Pepper Music and I look at their cold together editor's choice which is not amazing but at least it's called it together in some way shape or form um or for example if i uh elaine hagenberg you know she self-publishes so i know that this is elaine hagenberg's music so she doesn't have eight thousand pieces she's got 50 pieces so i can spend mm. a little investment of time to find her music and what i want so the thing that i was saying to you because we were talking about just in text back and forth about you know expanding the question is how do you expand in a way that makes it easier because i think graphite does a pretty good job of it graphite's one of the few companies that i think you go on there and, and you say i want something that's three minutes long for this voicing and this level of difficulty and it pulls it up in a way that you can actually find what you're looking for mm. Uh, yeah, and and I think that there's something to learn there. You know, as as uh, the as Endeavor progresses, I think the search function is something that I want to continue to really improve upon. Uh, I'm I'm really happy with the store platform. Beautiful, that, really beautiful. Thank you. Yeah, and and I think the score preview and the audio yeah. parts of that work really well. Being able to navigate between the different voicings because that's that's certainly something that I value a lot. I wanted is, let me let, let, yeah, let me plug that for you. Sure. The one thing that I really do did love is that you really made it an effort to say I've written this piece or whoever is has written this piece and we've got it in four or five voicings. Mm -hmm. So if you like the piece, it's gonna be accessible and attainable 
for whatever the format is for your group. And I'm guessing that if they don't, if you don't have the voicing that people want and they reach out to you, that that voicing will come pretty quickly. That's right. That's right. Yeah. And that's, that's pretty much how a lot of those voicings, not all, but how many of them came to be is I had a single voicing of DSE Ray to start. And you now somebody said, Oh, I like that, but why not TTB? And now TTB is actually the best selling version of that piece. Amazing. Um, yeah. And, and personally, I, I think this actually comes back to the idea of, uh, is there only one kind of ensemble that I'm going to write for? And is that advanced collegiate SATB choir? I, right. In the same way, I, I see it as, and I would encourage other composers to see it as a fun challenge to take your musical concepts and to try to reimagine that for a slightly different ensemble. Meaning, could it work for SATB choir? Could it also work for TTB? That's actually a challenging transition to make. And sometimes the answer is no, but I think that there is oftentimes a, uh, a, a barrier that we put up in our minds to say, well, no, I, I've imagined it this way and I could never imagine it another way, but our job is imagining. Our job is to imagine things and to imagine them into existence. And I, I personally, I think it's uh, just a really fun exercise of that same skill um so like, so yeah it, it means that the, when somebody can't do it it means that they're looking too close at it you yes. need to take a step back um it's one one composing mentor said to me about seven years ago he said can you try and write a piece completely diatonic where all the rhythms are the same mm. and you know it was the best challenge in the world and and that piece is one of my best selling pieces on my website and you know it's not compromised if you listen to it it's it's well crafted and structured beautifully sometimes you know you you have to reshape your mind and 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 rather than as a composer saying oh no i, I this piece can't go that way well it's it's not the same piece the piece changes you want mm -hmm. it to have a life of its own in a different variation. It's not supposed to be the same. It's supposed Absolutely. to work for different people. And and yeah, it, we can look back through history as well and see so many examples of composers who were given a very limited set of parameters for any number of reasons. And this was this was the ensemble that they had to write for and they had to make it work as well. And and I, I think we're doing ourselves a disservice if we if we think that um, we can't work within some kind of limitation or some kind right. of some kind of uh, structure. But I, I wanted to circle back though, because we it, I, great conversations go this way. We just follow okay. up yeah. tangent. Uh, but you were talking about the the user experience of coming to Endeavor Music Publishing and uh, how do they find great music? And so I think there's a, both a long-term answer and a short-term answer to that. Um, the the long-term answer is I, I, as the catalog grows, I, I want to continue to improve the search functionality so that difficulty is considered, uh, time length is considered, that um, things like keywords, are kind of tied uh, to to different uh, the different pieces and and the texts and I think it's really important that the text is always uh, displayed along with the with the piece and so any piece that you go to at Endeavor you're going to see the entire text of the piece you're going to be able to hear a recording and see the entire score um, but beyond that. Um, uh, so, so that's something that continues to be just a work in progress, a, a function of of growing beyond just self publishing. Um, but, but the other thing that I would say, as a more short term and and mid term answer to your question, is that I am going to be very picky about the music that I publish, and there there will be a range. I I, I do believe accessible means many things to many ensembles, and so. I, I want to continue to uh, write music that that could be performed by elementary choirs and middle school choirs and high school choirs and college choirs, but um, that that I'm going to grow slowly and I'm going to add to the catalog slowly. So that it's, it's my goal uh, that 
every time somebody comes to Endeavor, you know, every uh, twice, two or three times a year, that they're going to find something new that is high quality, that is good, that we're never going to churn, and that the uh, the bar will remain high. And so, if if you take the time to visit this website, that you're not going to be sold uh, something that is uh, has a motive other than making great art really accessible for your choir. And I, unfortunately, I think you know when we when we talk about incentives, I think uh, sometimes the incentive is volume rather than quality, and and the, right. the incentive here is always going to be quality. I love that. And so let let me ask you about your your uh, pricing model. Are sure. you currently selling per copy, or are you selling per ensemble? Uh, per copy, and uh, it, it basically uh, it, it's it might not be the answer that you expect, but uh, I kept finding uh, myself having to respond to emails uh, from folks who were just really confused about the per ensemble pricing model, um, and I I just. Uh, outside of my composing work and my work with Endeavor, I'm also a uh, choir director with uh, the Youth Course of Kansas City, and I, I stay really busy there. It's a very mission-based uh, nonprofit. And uh, so I, I moved to that model of per copy pricing because it, it seemed to be kind of the way the industry is was trending. And I, I think it's uh, there's also a service in simply... Uh, N not swimming too hard against the tide. Um, so I've I've been happy with the change, and I I I think uh, it seems to be uh, easier for folks to wrap their head around. Uh, you you you'd be surprised how many uh, choir directors have just never purchased a digital piece of music before. Um, print sales are still an incredible uh, an incredibly high part of the the overall sales that are happening in uh, the choral world yeah so now you do you have your uh the ability for people to buy print copies do you yes on, yeah yeah and pepper, or do you do it is it on your own website or on pepper it's both it's both so uh endeavor actually works with over 60 retailers uh uh both uh, domestically and internationally. So if you have a local retailer that you work with, that you purchase music through, uh, we can work with them, uh, accepting purchase orders and all of that. Uh, so I, I think that's just an important thing uh, to know if you're going to go into publishing or even self-publishing. Uh, I think it's important to to be open to, you know, what it not just what serves uh you but also what serves your customers and for so many of our customers they they really want to support their local retailers mm -hmm. um those local retailers are you know just busting their hump to to provide great service sure. to, yeah to music educators so so i love working with local retailers um i work with jw pepper and uh that's a really important service i think that i provide to uh our composers as well because there's yeah. so much yeah, there's so much exposure that happens through the editor's choice uh, at review process, and and besides editor's choice, they also have uh, other catalog or you know other promotional considerations like catalogs, print catalogs, emails, things like that. Um, and then uh, through the website, yeah, uh, folks can purchase a uh, printed copy uh, or a digital copy through the website. And uh, shipping speed is really fast. Um, so I, how, do you, how do you do the printed copies? What's your sure? Uh, yeah, sure. So, so I uh, uh, kind of a multi-part answer. Uh, I, I've worked with different. Uh, I, I've gone with several different models. I've tried several ways. So everybody can learn from my uh, trial and error here. Um, but the first one was working with a, a third-party. Uh, print-on-demand service, mm -hmm. and that was okay, but I found that the the turnaround time was taking a little bit too long, so somebody might order a piece off my website, be, that would be forwarded on to print-on-demand, and then within, you know, a week or so, sometimes up to a week uh, before that music was printed and shipped. 
And you know, as a director, that's that's an issue. Sure. Yeah. Um, and then I, I also tried working with a warehousing company uh, where they would actually maintain stock of the printed copies and then ship those out. So turnaround time was faster, but the overhead just became too much uh, to deal with, especially because I, I started that right before COVID hit. Oof. And so I simply wasn't able to maintain it at that time. And in the meantime, uh, uh, I started to look into uh, actual printing, in-house printing, and uh, found that that was actually pretty affordable. Uh, and so between a combination of that and uh, a lot of automation software, that means every time an order comes in, I, I press a single button and the uh, printed copies uh, show up off my printer five minutes later, ready to ship. Um, that's how I do it now. Um, but, you know, it's, uh, it, it's a combination. Through JW Pepper, it's print on demand. Uh, they print and ship the, the copies. And so uh, essentially, it's a kitchen sink approach to being able to meet every customer where they are. Yeah. Because I've had s similar experiences with, so I switched to, I switched to the full ensemble model on my website because it seemed as if I had a minimum of 15 copies and just about every choir that I ever purchased from me had 15 members in it. So I don't fault anybody for their choices. I can understand budgets are tight and people are going to do what they need to do. But I said, you know what? maybe there's a reason why this is happening. It's not because these are bad human beings. They're, I probably would have done the same thing. So if I make the model where it's a little bit more expensive, but it really is for the ensemble, then it would, then it would serve the ensemble. Now the issue lies, like you just mentioned, I had somebody contact me. They only go through a distribution company. They can't purchase through me. Um, so how do we do this? So I called the the uh, distributor and music local local in my where where I live, and they said we don't give out digital copies, we print them, and provide them. So then I needed to go back to the old model for this order by selling it by copy. But the company was then going to individually print all of the music off of my website essentially with a pdf and they're going to staple it and do all that stuff and ship it out so it's sort of like we're in this middle ground world because people are using ipads for reading music we all have computers that could print music instantly we all have photocopy machines that could that could produce music and frankly the old school way doesn't work because there are mistakes in the music that never get fixed. And, mm. you know, I'm sure you have music that you take out and you're like, this music is wrong. Well, I can't believe this is, you know, wrong. And uh, our music might be wrong the first time we hand it out, but it's not wrong the second time because we just put a new PDF up. And uh, mm -hmm. I think that that's another thing that, that, um, that choral directors should, should, be aware of that the digital copies are going to be cleaner yeah in many cases absolutely no that's that's absolutely true and if you purchase through the publisher website in that case you're most likely to get the most updated version yeah. of the music the pdf download through the publisher website is pretty much always going to be the most updated it, it oftentimes takes other other retailers or uh, you know, just other companies much longer to kind of work through their own internal processes uh, to get to that point. But there's there's really something to be said for being small and nimble and maintaining a small overhead as well um, that makes it really easy. And and just being artistically driven. You know, I don't I don't want my music or the music of any composers who I'm supporting to be to have some egregious error. Uh, yeah. Yeah, even even if it's in the piano reduction, that matters, yeah. and it affects the rehearsal process. And I want to get it fixed. Um, so yeah, it's it's something to know. It's it's uh, I, I certainly try to avoid the errors uh, at every step along the way, but it's true. It's uh, it, it's tough to do. Awesome. So let me ask you one last question. Um, sure. 
what what do you feel of all that you've done so far in the composing world the now publishing world what are you most proud of and what do you hope you accomplish in the next few years oh my gosh that's a that's a great question it's uh it's a there there's a lot a lot there um i i think for uh, I'm I'm gonna have to break my answer into two parts. I hope you don't mind. Okay. Uh, I, I I have to answer first as a composer, uh, and and that's to say, I think that I write music that gets kids excited about choir. And and what I especially love about that is that sometimes uh, I think my music serves a particular niche, where it's oftentimes kids who maybe weren't excited about choir before and they they find this new kind of fire uh for choir uh, to in pieces like dsc ray right uh in pieces like inventing on Viam, which is my first latin piece i wrote 10 years after i wrote dsc ray um wow that has this really cool ancient text and on Viam not faciam which means i will either find a way or make one and I, I wrote that in the midst of COVID. And it just, I think it has this epic nature that kids really connect with and it's very accessible. And then I just I just wrote one more recently called Legatum. Uh, that's just, it's pretty wild. It's pretty all over the place, um, but it's, it's Latin and it's intense, it's driving, it's natural minor. And I think that as a composer, what makes me most proud is hearing from kids who are in middle school or high school and they say my choir just sang this at contest and we all loved it you know and i yeah and i can just you, you can see based on which videos they're commenting on those are the pieces that are just setting them on fire for this for this art form and i think it's really important to know that those kids who, who get that light bulb turned on are then going to go on and they're going to sing in the more advanced choirs and they're going to uh they're going to then sing the six part a cappella renaissance piece with a, with a new perspective that they may not have been able to find interest in before and, and so that's what i'm proud of as a composer is that uh i i love writing for every level but i especially love i think setting that fire for kids that's what i love and now as a as a publisher, um, it's I'm so early in this process, um, but I I really I'll, I'll actually I'll, I'll tell this in story form. Uh, I have a good friend um, who I don't I don't think he would mind if I I shared this story. Uh, his name's Micah Horton, and uh, a brilliant choir director in the Kansas City area. Uh, great guitarist and. Um, and great composer and he uh, at some point i think he had sent me this piece a few years ago before i'd really had this idea to expand and asked for my thoughts and i gave him some thoughts and as i was starting to to move forward the idea of endeavor music publishing i i reached back out to micah and i said hey can you send me that piece again i'd really like to to take another look and i just in those few years, I, I think built the skills uh, to really be his editor, to help him get that piece ready for publication. Uh, not only that, but to, uh, to come up with a second voicing, which he and I worked through together, um, through that process of creating not just an SSA version, but also an SATB, creating a, an optional piano accompaniment because it was originally just for guitar and SSA, and essentially just broadening the appeal that's something that I was already awesome. And, you know, we, after we had sat down to kind of go through the recording process, uh, he just, he looked at me and he said, thanks for believing in me. And it, it just, it meant the world to me. You know, I, I had, I, I love um, helping people find this, this potential in themselves. And I, I think, as a choir director, as a publisher, it's it's something that I value so much is is being able to see the potential in people who maybe don't even see the potential in themselves, mm. and 
Um, I think that is going to be what I have to bring most to the world of publishing is I, I, I think it's going to be a model that even established composers, Elaine Hagenberg hit me up. I would love to publish your music, <laughs> but, <laughs> but <Me too>. yeah, <laughs> um, please, please. Mm -hmm. Um, but, uh, but, but I love finding that potential and bringing up potential and others. And I, I, I think, um, that that's, maybe what I, uh, you know, in a hundred years, if I'm remembered at all, maybe it'll be for that. I can see you uh, building an online community with an online course where you mm. get ah. potential composers involved. That might be, it sounds like a passion that can relate directly to what you're doing and uh, could, could end up resulting in publications, but people coming to you who want mentorship, who you are very selective on who you take in and um you know they're they're part of a, a community and then at the end the people that you want to publish you would publish something mm -hmm. to think about you could add that on i you know what i love that idea i i, I honestly the thought never even crossed my mind i i get uh blinders on i don't know if you're this way too uh <laughs> what once i've kind of set my mind to something it's like here's what i'm doing but Honestly, I love that idea. I, I may very well take that and run with it. I'd be happy to uh, to brainstorm that. And, and another call, we'll make another call and do this. But yeah, no, I think, it's a, I think it's a great idea because your eyes light up when you talk about helping other composers and you want to not only help them, but give them that platform when you feel that they're ready. And so yeah. it, it sounds like rather than it being behind the scenes, why not make it something that's part of your business mission? Yeah, and, uh, and it might be. I know now you have your head spinning. Sorry about that. That's that's, <laughs> the way, that's the way my brain works. My brain is always about planting seeds. I'm thinking about new ideas, and if I were in his shoes, what would I be doing? That's, <laughs> <laughs> I um, love it. Yeah, that, that's awesome. But um, I'm I'm so glad we finally got to talk, and I'm sure this will not be this will be the first time of of many moving forward. Um, and hopefully we'll find other ways to collaborate. But I hope everybody listening is going to check out Endeavor Publishing. Um, check out Ryan Main's work. He writes beautiful music, and I'm sure everything on that site is, uh, is going to be at that level. And uh, I will certainly be ordering music for my ensembles. So thank you so oh, much. Thank you so much. This has been so much fun. Awesome. Thanks. <laughs>